1942, deep within Rolls-Royce secret workshops, engineers were building the impossible, a two-stroke V12 that promised to deliver jet-like power from pistons. The Cressy was meant to dominate the skies. Instead, it vanished into history's shadows before firing a shot in anger. As the Battle of Britain raged and bombers darkened European skies, the Air Ministry knew a terrible truth. Conventional engines were reaching their limits. The enemy was developing faster fighters, higher flying bombers, and radical new power plants. Britain needed something revolutionary, not just better, but different. In the depths of wartime derby, Henry Ricardo and Rolls-Royce answered with an engine so advanced, so unconventional, that even today engineers marvel at its audacity. The Cressy promised to squeeze 2,500 horsepower from a package lighter than engines producing half that power. But in the race between pistons and jets, timing would prove to be everything. The Rolls-Royce Cressy wasn't just another V-12, it was heresy made metal. While the world's aircraft engines breathed through four-stroke cycles, the Cressy defied convention with two-stroke fury. Its specifications read like fantasy. 26.1 liters of displacement channeled through sleeve valves instead of traditional poppets, force-fed by a two-stage supercharger, and cooled by a revolutionary spray cooling system that eliminated the need for a traditional radiator. This aluminum predator could theoretically produce 2,500 horsepower while weighing less than a Merlin producing 1,600. Where the Merlin sang, the Cressy screamed. Its two-stroke design meant it fired on every revolution, not every other. Double the power pulses, double the violence. Engineers who heard it run described a sound unlike any piston engine before or since, a banshee wail overlaid with mechanical thunder, as if someone had weaponized the very concept of controlled explosion. This was an evolution. It was revolution cast in aluminum and steel. The engine's architecture defied every convention of the era. Each cylinder featured a single sleeve valve that rotated and reciprocated simultaneously, creating ports that opened and closed with mechanical precision. This eliminated the complex valve trains, camshafts, and rocker arms that cluttered conventional engines. The Cressy's compact design packed 12 cylinders into a block shorter than most V8s. Its stroke-to-bore ratio pushed the boundaries of mechanical possibility, while the spray cooling system promised to eliminate the massive radiators that created drag on every fighter aircraft. Here was an engine that could theoretically deliver the power of tomorrow in a package smaller than yesterday. If only it could be made to work reliably. If you're fascinated by engines that defied conventional wisdom, hit subscribe now. We're uncovering the forgotten power plants that almost changed everything and the reasons they vanished. From its birth in 1941, the Cressy fought for its life. Sir Harry Ricardo, the genius behind its sleeve valve design, had convinced Rolls-Royce that two-stroke technology could leapfrog the Germans. But building it proved a nightmare wrapped in impossibility. The sleeve valves, critical to the design, warped under extreme heat. The spray cooling system, which injected coolant directly into cylinder walls, created thermal shocks that cracked components. Test engines consumed oil at alarming rates, sometimes burning through their entire supply in minutes. The air ministry watched with growing skepticism. Every month of delay meant more spitfires and hurricanes needed conventional Merlins. Every failed test meant resources diverted from proven designs. Chief Engineer Arthur Rolidge pushed his team to the breaking point, working double shifts in blacked-out factories while bombs fell on Derby. One engineer later recalled, We were building tomorrow's engine while fighting today's war. Some nights, we wondered if either would survive. Technical challenges mounted like casualties in a losing battle. Metallurgy of the 1940s struggled to create sleeve valves that could withstand the extreme temperatures and pressures. The two-stroke cycle, while theoretically superior, proved viciously difficult to control. Unlike four-stroke engines that had distinct phases for each operation, the Cressy's overlapping cycles demanded microsecond precision. Exhaust gases refused to evacuate properly, contaminating the incoming charge. The spray cooling system, revolutionary in concept, proved nightmarish in practice. Too little coolant and components melted. Too much and thermal shock shattered cylinders like glass. Each solution spawned new problems. Each breakthrough revealed fresh impossibilities. By late 1942, with jets whispering promises of propellerless future and production Merlins desperately needed, bureaucrats began asking uncomfortable questions. Why chase this mechanical unicorn when Frank Whittle's jet engine offered cleaner solutions? The Cressy team knew they were racing not just against technical problems, but against time itself. Here's where the Cressy story turns tragic. It never got its chance. While Merlins roared over Europe and Pratt and & Whitney's dominated the Pacific, the Cressy remained earthbound confined to test cells and ground runs. 
By 1943, when the engine finally achieved stable operation at 2,000 horsepower, the world had already begun to change. The Gloucester Meteor jet fighter took its first flight, the ME-262 Prowl German Skies. The future was arriving on a whisper of kerosene, not the thunder of pistons. Test pilots who flew Cressy-powered aircraft in trials reported extraordinary performance. One classified report described climb rates that defied belief, an acceleration that pressed you into the seat like nothing else. A Hawker Henley test aircraft fitted with an early Cressy reportedly achieved speeds that remained classified for decades, but these were shadows of what might have been. Tantalizing glimpses of a parallel timeline where sleeve valves ruled the sky. The closest the Cressy came to combat glory was a proposed installation in the Miles M20 emergency fighter. Plans existed for Cressy-powered Spitfires that could have climbed to 40,000 feet in minutes. Engineers dreamed of mosquitoes that could outrun anything in the sky. But dreams don't win wars, and the Cressy remained forever on the threshold of greatness. Behind the Cressy's cancellation lay a secret that Rolls-Royce buried for decades. The engine was too good. Declassified documents reveal the Air Ministry's fear that the Cressy's radical efficiency would destabilize existing production. Retooling factories for sleeve valves would halt Merlin production for months. Training mechanics on two-stroke technology would create chaos and field maintenance. Most damning of all, the Cressy's thirst for special oils and exotic coolants made it a logistics nightmare. But the real shock came from within Rolls-Royce itself. Sir Henry Royce's successors discovered that pursuing the Cressy meant abandoning jet development. In secret meetings throughout 1944, executives faced an impossible choice. Perfect the ultimate piston engine or pivot to turbines. One board member allegedly stated, We can build the finest gramophone ever made, just as the world discovers radio. The decision was made in shadows, communicated in whispers. By December 1944, the Cressy's fate was sealed. Not by failure, but by being too revolutionary for its own good. The financial reality proved equally shocking. Development costs had spiraled beyond initial projections by 400%. Each test engine cost as much as 10 production Merlins. The exotic materials required, special bronze alloys for the sleeve valves, high temperature steels for the spray cooling nozzles, were desperately needed for other war production. A confidential treasury report calculated that fielding Cressy-powered aircraft would cost three times more per unit than conventional fighters. In wartime, when quantity often trumped quality, this economic reality proved insurmountable. The very innovations that made the Cressy remarkable also made it economically impossible. Internal memos paint a picture of institutional betrayal. Engineers who'd sacrificed years were told to destroy their notes. Test data vanished into classified archives. The handful of complete engines were dismantled, their exotic components scattered. One engineer bitterly noted, we killed our own child because it threatened its siblings. Still with us? Great! Why not hit that like button and share with some of your friends? More to come! March 1945 brought the Cressy's finest and final hour. In a desperate bid to save their creation, the development team arranged a demonstration that would prove the engine's worth beyond doubt. At a secret facility, they installed their most refined Cressy, serial number V12, into a modified Hawker Tempest. What happened next remained classified until 1995. The Cressy-powered Tempest didn't just fly, it shattered expectations. Climbing from sea level to 30,000 feet in under six minutes, it outpaced pursuing Spitfire 14s like they were training aircraft. At altitude, test pilot Roland Beaumont pushed the aircraft to speeds that bent instrumentation needles beyond their limits. His laconic report stated, Aircraft performance exceeds all reasonable expectations. Engine temperature stable. Pilot confidence absolute. The numbers told an even more dramatic story. Where a standard Tempest 5 with its Napier Sabre produced 2,180 horsepower and struggled past 435 miles per hour, the Cressy variant touched 485 miles per hour in level flight, faster than the jets of its era. Its rate of climb exceeded 5,000 feet per minute, nearly double that of contemporary fighters. The engine's specific fuel consumption, despite its two-stroke design, proved remarkably efficient at altitude. Ground crews reported that after an hour of aggressive testing, the engine showed no signs of the wear that had plagued earlier versions. For one glorious afternoon, the Cressy fulfilled every impossible promise its designers had made. But even this triumph couldn't save the Cressy. That same week, the first production Rolls-Royce Derwent jet engines were delivered. The future had already been decided in boardrooms, not test flights. When V-12 was shut down for the last time, witnesses reported it took three hours to cool, as if the engine itself refused to die. You could hear it ticking in the hangar, one mechanic remembered. 
like a massive clock counting down to obsolescence. Only six complete Cressy engines were ever built. Today, just one survives intact, hidden in the Science Museum's reserve collection. A 2,500 horsepower ghost gathering dust. The rest were victims of corporate house cleaning and Cold War paranoia. In 1946, Rolls-Royce officially terminated the project, reassigning its engineers to jet development. The sleeve valve technology that promised revolution became a footnote in textbooks. Yet the Cressy's influence echoes through aviation history. Its spray cooling concepts appeared in rocket engines. Its sleeve valve research influenced marine power plants. Most importantly, the engineers who cut their teeth on its impossible challenges became the architects of Britain's jet age. Stanley Hooker, who wrestled with Cressy supercharging, went on to design the Pegasus engine that powered the Harrier. The failure taught success. The technical documentation that survived tells a story of astounding achievement. Test data from 1944 shows the engine achieving 2,400 horsepower reliably, with brief peaks exceeding 2,800, numbers that wouldn't be matched by production piston engines until well into the 1950s. The sleeve valve design, once perfected, showed wear rates superior to conventional poppet valves. The spray cooling system, refined through countless failures, achieved thermal efficiency levels that modern engineers still find impressive. These weren't just promises or projections. They were demonstrated, documented facts that arrived at precisely the wrong moment in history. Aviation enthusiasts still debate what might have been. Computer simulations suggest a refined Cressy could have pushed piston engine fighters past 500 miles per hour in level flight. The Korean War, fought with jets barely faster than late war pistons, might have seen Cressy powered Tempest dominating MiG Alley. Instead, the ultimate piston engine became aviation's greatest ghost. Forever powerful, forever untested, forever asking. What if? The Cressy teaches us that in technology as in war, timing beats brilliance. Here was an engine that solved every problem of piston power, weight, cooling, volumetric efficiency, just as those problems ceased to matter. It was a masterpiece painted as the gallery burned, a symphony composed for instruments about to become obsolete. But perhaps that's the Cressy's true legacy, the reminder that engineers must sometimes build the impossible simply to prove it can be done. Every test run that shook Derby's foundations, every sleeve valve that finally sealed perfectly, every impossible horsepower wrung from explosive air, these were acts of defiance against limitation itself. The Cressy failed to fight but succeeded in showing that even in failure, audacity has value. In the end, the Rolls-Royce Cressy was too early to save the piston age and too late to prevent the jet revolution. It exists now only in photographs and patents, in the memories of men who heard it roar, and in the dreams of those who understand that sometimes the greatest engines are the ones that never got their war. The Cressy's roar may be silenced, but its story deserves to be heard. If you enjoyed this deep dive into aviation's ultimate what-if, drop a like and subscribe for more. Should we explore the Napier Sabre's tragic tale next, or uncover the Bristol Centaurus that actually made it to war? Let us know in the comments below. Until then, keep looking up and wondering what might have been.